Parents and welcome to Parents Canada Talk Radio. I am Jason Thompson. I'm here with my co-host. Lisa Durante. I think I'm a little over-caffeinated this morning, nope. which is good. You know, sat in the, the parking lot next to my uh, daughter's high school, did some work this morning and had one extra cup of coffee. So I'm ready to go. And it's actually going to be a really good topic today. We're going to be talking mm-hmm. about how we help, how, how you help couples kind of thrive after they have kids. Because, well, I learned some pretty shocking stuff uh, yesterday in the research. Uh, well, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Mm-hmm. You know, it's uh, second week, so extracurriculars are all kind of gearing up and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Lisa, how's the week in parenting going for you? Uh, it's going well. So parenting is fine, but we've we've run into a stumbling block. Oh, dear. So caregiving has fallen through. Um, so we always have, uh, we had a, a, a woman who came to care for my kids after school, so an after school nanny. And she... Um, uh, gave in her notice and so I'm on day three of no care after school so it's been a bit of a challenge um, and I know that I'm not alone because this is an issue that is across the GTA across Ontario across Canada it's a big issue um, that uh, you know that that caregiving really affects 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 um, affects families um, and and what is happening is like for working parents especially especially working moms because it usually falls on their shoulders is that if you don't have care for your children you just can't work and so for the last couple of days I'm lucky like so I sit in a position of privilege because I have uh, my I run my own business and I work from home so for me it's it's really just managing and juggling my schedule um, it is causing for some late nights working um, but we're still on day three um, but I'm, I'm really excited for a conversation because we have been in this position in the past and um, it has caused a strain on our relationship. <laughs> so I, I can speak to that. It yeah. happened 24 hours ago in yeah. a pickup. You know, somebody uh, thought they were picking up and another yeah. person had to pick up and had to wait for the bus to do the full loop. Ooh. And oh, it was, uh, it, you know what? It, again, it, it happens. But mm-hmm. I think really what you're saying is uh, everyone if uh, at Parents Canada, tweet us out. If you got your resume, Lisa wants to read it. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, if, you, if, you're, if you're looking for part-time work <laughs> in the afternoon. You know, it's, yeah. That's always the, t- the, the toughest thing I find. You know, just with the the shift in kind of uh, timing for schools, you know, I, with the three that I've got, there's always, you know, this year, one school went earlier, another one went off to high school, which happened to coincide with the same time. So, mm-hmm. you know, week two is uh, trying to iron out a lot of those wrinkles, a lot of those wrinkles. It, it, yeah, 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 yeah. And this has happened, I have to say, this is an annual thing for us. We always struggle finding care. Um, you know, if it's, you know, making sure that we are in the right line to get the after school programs, which at this point is now not available to us because the waiting list is like the length of my leg. Uh, so, and and everyone else seems to have gotten a job at this point. So we're just kind of in a, a bit of a crunch. There needs to be like the like the Uber or the work sh- we work of after school care sort of. There needs to be like something like that. that d- d- yeah. I don't know how you possibly figure it out with well, all privacy issues and safety and things like that. But. Yeah. Well, yeah, it, it's a big issue. And now that we, not that I want to make this political, but uh, it should be one uh, because it impacts Canadians, so many Canadians, um, quite severely at times. So we can spend the next hour talking about it. I'm watching Justin Trudeau behind you saying the writ has dropped. I actually just explained to my eight-year-old last night, we were trying to figure, you know, I said the the election's going to start tomorrow and, you know, you try and explain. So how do you you explain the parliamentary system to an (laughs) eight-year-old? So we did it using, you know, colors and teams that's always an easy one to get into yeah we uh, usually talk about teams yeah yeah it should uh, it's, it's interesting it's always interesting to have those types of conversations yeah. because you know when they're kids it's it's uh, there's no gray right it's like mm-hmm. good bad mm-hmm. ugly and that sort of stuff and uh, unfortunately yeah. the, the uh, political system feeds into that a fair bit there is no gray right it's either yeah. you're for you're for us or you're against us sort mm-hmm. of thing mm-hmm. a team of rivals which was a great book about Abraham Lincoln I, I think uh, we could all take a, a couple of pages from that one anything else yeah. going on is parents and no, that honestly is taking up my my world right now. Is is um, in addition to the job and the parenting is then looking for um, 
how can I solve my caregiving problem right now? <laughs> and so it's it's a lot on my plate. At the I, I hear you. Yeah. My fingers crossed. It's interesting you said about that being uh, for moms. In, mm-hmm. in my life, I'm I'm actually the guy who's responsible for the after school stuff, mm-hmm. uh, which I love. I absolutely adore the fact that I can meet the kids after school. That I you know that I can shuttle them from A to B. I'd say I I'd say I do probably between sixty and seventy percent of the extracurricular driving and, and things mm-hmm. like that. But at, at the same time, you know like. Uh, both my partner and I, we we run our own businesses. There are fires that pop up when you don't expect them, and things yeah. like that. I think one of the things we can do, I think, for each other is is that idea of giving us some grace because it is it is I think the single largest area of confusion and argument. Sometimes you know we live in two households, and and it's like, well, who's making dinner? And and you know mm-hmm. that doesn't get asked until about you know ten to five every day. And you can see <laughs> once you wow. once you start negotiating in an area where you have kind of an emotional, uh, there's a real emotional impact there's no winner there's no mm-hmm. in fact in some of the research that we had for today's topic they said you know one of the things is do not have a conversation with your spouse that is a kind of a big halo conversation about how you can move forward and continue to love each other deeply at two o'clock in the morning when the baby's crying yeah i think it's, it sounds obvious but how many times do we get kind of locked up into that because a trigger hits you here and then mm-hmm. the emotion kind of pops out there and that sort of stuff yeah, 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 yeah. It, well, there. I think that's that's true. Even you know, beyond those very early months of parenthood, and as you, as 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 your relationship moves forward, you're, there's always that that you know that period that that argument or whatever that then kind of explodes. Now, when you say and, that period, you mean like eighteen, nineteen years? Is that like no? Because I'm finding I'm still case. having the same <laughs> arguments I I had a decade ago. They just they they tend to change flavor. Yeah, well, that, that I think that's true of any relationship. Like if I think back to my brothers, my mother used to say, "How is it that you have the same argument over and over again?" <laughs> um, and we do. Uh, so I think that's true of any relationship. But it's it's how do you. Um, how do you circumvent this? That's interesting because you, you talk um, like I've talked with a number of therapists over the years, you mm-hmm. know, personally and professionally. And you look at the idea that um, the the dance is the same over and over. Mm-hmm. And it really is in some ways up to the second person. So the person like something triggers the first person. Mm-hmm. They react. And then it's the, up to the second person to make the decision. And the decision is, are you going to propagate the cycle mm-hmm. or are you going to disrupt the cycle? And the thing is, is so for example, you know, if you have, let, let's say again, somebody didn't get picked up from the bus, and the first person says, "You never, you never pick up the kids from the bus." Uh, I, you know, I, I'm really upset, and you know, this is ridiculous, and you're never helping out, and that sort of stuff. The second person has to make the decision: Do I react to that, or do I respond to say, "Hey, listen, let's take a second and take a step back and kind of de-escalate the situation." This is a, really kind of what professional professional moderators and facilitators have taught me: is that idea of you have that that choice, but it's not an easy thing when the gun is pointed at you, mm-hmm. right? It really isn't because it's like, hang on, but what's the line? This is the classic therapist line. Do you want to be right <laughs> or do you want to be happy? And I think it's a good line, not every single time out, but I, I get it because the thing is, is if you're going to spend all of your time trying to be right, you're going to be very unhappy, mm-hmm. which brings us into today's yeah. topic, I think, in a really big way. Yeah. Well, well just to go back to what yeah, you're yeah. saying that it's, um, I think it's a choice on each individual. Like, yes, a person is triggered, but an individual, because uh, I have been the person who is triggered as, as I am the person who has responded to a trigger, but there have been times where I'm like, okay, am I going to react <laughs> Or am I going to, like, how am I going to react to this? What is the best way? Because the last time it didn't work out or, you know, so each person makes a choice, I think, each and every time. There's no doubt about it. But I think from the research that I've uncovered, it's it's that second movement that actually has, because the first person is, that's kind of the inciting incident, if you will, using Mm -hmm. a uh, kind of a literary term, is that that, that's the jostling thing that can really, really kind of create the energy of the conversation. And that, that tone or energy of the conversation is actually a huge huge part. Like if a trigger incident happens to somebody, if you can step out of that and say, oh, you know, this just happened and it's frustrating me, that's a, that's an amazing level of mm-hmm. self-control. But typically what happens is the inciting incident happens and you get jostled and then you blast something in your area, like maybe you're accusatory, maybe you're just angry, maybe you, you know, maybe you yell, whatever it is, that second person who has actually, they're, they're, they're getting the photocopy of the conversation in a way, right? Like they, they've seen the inciting incident happen and they They've seen the person react to it, and now they actually can can invest or not invest. So I, mm-hmm. I'm absolutely with you that if you have that 
level of emotional intelligence where you can stop from a trigger mm-hmm. and say, I'm frustrated. Like name the, the line that they t- commonly use in, in, uh, in, in kind of the language around that is, is name the emotion, don't show the emotion. Mm-hmm. If you can do that, then you're a more evolved human being than I, for sure. <laughs> but I think, I think that, that, the, the, uh, that secondary element, your partner or whoever it is you're having a conversation with, can really, they can name it. They say, you seem really frustrated. Are you okay? And then suddenly the de-escalation mm-hmm. can begin. It's an interesting mm-hmm. thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're going to be talking with Allison Vila in um, in just, uh, you know, in, in a little bit. Um, but I know that, you know, we did a lot of research for this and some of it was, was interesting because, you know, I find that you know, there was one one article that we read was about how it's so important to put your marriage before your kids, um, and that was on ParentsCanada.com. So please check that out. It was just such an interesting read. And But I have to say that while I was reading it, I was like, well, yeah, <laughs> I get that. Um, and, and I think it was because, you know, there were so many times, you know, and examples in my childhood and, and even in my adulthood that I've seen others before I had kids um, that they invested everything into their children um, rather than investing the time in each other. And then it becomes difficult to manage that relationship as you're going through the storm because parenthood is very much a... Um, Full contact sport? Yeah, it's like it's it's a pressure cooker, you know. Sure. Um, a lot well, of times people will say that it's like the it causes um, marriage failure or it causes the relationship. Well, there's the lead because in uh, many of the pieces of uh, information that we did some research, here it is. And Mm -hmm. this is the naked truth is if you have children, you are compromising your happiness and possibly your relationship. This is what the uh, now, now that's what now. The, but hold on again. So you argue with me because it's it's your perspective. No, 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 data, it's not perspective. The data uh, says that by and large that the numbers so, show that yeah. the happiness can be affected. So this is this is my problem with that data is that it's based on a false hypothesis. So it goes into it starts off with the belief that if you have children, you will be happy. You will have a satisfied you know, relationship, but then you can replace children or parenthood with anything else. Money. Money will not make you more happy. Money will not make your relationship more satisfying. Um, Illness will make you less happy. Illness will, could impact your satisfaction in your marriage. So that's my issue with that kind of data is that I think it starts from a place that is not a truth uh, rather than so, so it goes, it sets the expectation. And I think that that is part of the problem. That's the narrative that continues to be repeated over and over again, is that if you get married, you will be happy. If you have children, you will be happy. If you get the right job, you will be happy. When really, we have to look at ourselves um, and, and what is it that we can do to make ourselves happy. And that's something that Allison will talk about. Um, I know that self-care and sense of self is something that she says is the starting point for yeah, again, what's the for again that. the line is you are responsible for your own happiness yeah and but, so that, that that's that's where I I that's that's just my that's why I'm challenging that data because I, I just I feel like we always like to point put the blame on other things um, well the question is is and I think that the opportunity is like you use the line that having kids is a pressure cooker and there's absolutely mm-hmm. no doubt about it having yeah. my eight-year-old standing on the stairs last Wednesday you know kind of you know, getting upset saying I want I want to spend my night here rather than at mom's house sort of thing and you can feel the rise in the tension and and it didn't it did not end well for the mm. conversation overall it actually ended up in, sure. in a pretty significant fight oh. so the question then becomes is 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 that is how in in that moment in that moment where things are really blowing up and and the kids being the wild card is how do you as a parent manage that effectively together and we're going to talk about that in a couple minutes and in the third segment i'm actually going to talk about something something really interesting to me which is the idea of having that meta conversation at the beginning to say what is our philosophy and our approach to having kids and how are we going to do that so that we before before all of the, before the baby appears having that conversation because we go to parenting classes and we go to lamaze classes and we go to all of these sorts of things to make sure the baby's okay. What are we going to do to make sure that we're okay? Mm, I don't think I ever had that conversation. In fact, I know even now with a a child who's turning nine, it's nine years in, I still haven't had that conversation. (laughs) And the thing is, is it is causing conflict. There's no no doubt that almost 100% of the significant arguments that I have have some sort of root in the parenting and it's because we're not aligned on the philosophy. Mm. So I want to hear hear more from our guests today about how I get on the same page. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we will be back with Alice 
Alice and Vila right after the break. We want to hear about you. So if you have any questions about relationships after having kids, join us at Parents Canada on all of the platforms or give us a call in at 416-640-0200. We'll be back with more from Parents Canada Talk Radio on Newstalk Saga 960. Hello and welcome back to Parents Canada Talk Radio. You're listening on Saga 960. Welcome, Allison. So excited to have you. So Allison is a registered psychotherapist, and she specializes in keeping couples thriving throughout parenthood. She's a wife and a mother, and she understands how raising a family can affect the romantic relationship. And I'm only laughing because this is so true. The romantic relationship and the challenges that modern parents face. Um, so Allison, both Jason and I have so many questions. Uh, this conversation is two decades too crazy. late. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to hearing your take on this, Jason. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, why don't we start? Why don't we start by the the at the beginning? And and uh, I guess I'm going to end up using myself as a case study sort of thing. <laughs> is is okay. what it, like? What are you seeing in terms of you know um, parenting and the ability to stay connected with one another while you know you are navigating the minefield that is having kids? This what? is a great question. Yeah. So, in my experience, personally and professionally you can see that parents have the best of intentions. You know, we want to be the best parent we can be to our children. And so we tune into their needs. We build our schedules and our lives around meeting all of their needs. And with that really great intention, we lose sight of the person we're doing that with. Mm. So it comes from such a beautiful, positive place. And so it really just means that parents just by being mindful of, oh, yeah, I just need to take a moment to connect with my partner, that it can actually be the most important gift we can give our kids because then we're aligned and connected and they feel that. Mm. Yeah. You know, I, I, uh, I find, again, that in my own life that I get so kind of tangled up in the minutia, I, you know, I'll be blunt, the minutia of stupidity that is <laughs> who's picking up what, who's making, like, these are not difficult conversations and because you spend so much, mm -hmm. you, and again, I'll be blunt, you waste so much energy on this. What ends up mm -hmm. happening is you don't have any energy at the end of it to be able to have civil you know, nourishing conversations. So, you know, obviously I, I'm unpacking something that's much <laughs> larger than a singular incident here, but, you know, you talk about this idea of that self-care is a great place to start with this. Is that, you know, that line of making yourself happy is a good place. So why don't you start there to say, how can self-care affect this in a positive way? Absolutely. So I'm really glad you're bringing this up because for every relationship before and after kids, it is so important for us to take care of ourselves first. Mm -hmm. So, like, think about new parents, okay? Taking care of yourselves as individuals is essential. You know, you're all getting uh, very little sleep, and just meeting your own basic needs at that early stage of parenthood is so important. So we need to be taking care of ourselves, filling ourselves up as individuals before we can show up for our partners and even for our families as our best version of ourselves, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. One of the things, you know, because part of self-care, and this is something that I experienced after having my kids, was really figuring out who in the world I was. Like, I felt mm -hmm. like I was struggling as to who I was. And I just didn't know how to actually care for myself because I didn't know who I was anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and so how does that that whole, because it's such a, a big identity shift. And, and I don't think it's just for the mom that's going through that because dad is, dad is likely going through this identity shift as well because now they're tacking on this role of par uh, you know, parent or dad or mom. Um, how is it that we can kind of navigate that together? Mm -hmm. um, while, Absolutely, while Lisa. Keep going, sorry. I'm I was just going to say, so how there. can we just figure it out and, and kind of stay together? Because oftentimes it feels like we're, it's, it's a diversion. It, you, you know, you can kind of go in different directions. Yes, I love that you're acknowledging that this happens to both parents. And it's our sense of self changes after we have kids. Because your whole sense of self is it's your perception of you, your traits, your beliefs, and your purpose in the world. And in that shift after we have kids, and 
and and that happens for you know as you're saying men and women it's it, it's an experience that we're both going through together and I think I, I love what you said you said I didn't even know what I need I didn't even know who I was mm-hmm. I didn't even know how to explore that so uh, you know, sometimes we try to go back to the interests that we had before kids to feel like, oh, this filled me up before. I enjoyed this before. But, but now after kids, it's not, it's not filling me up because you're right. Your sense of self does shift and change. So it's such a big conversation about what does self care look like? What, what, like what's happening to my sense of self? And I always like to think of, well, what's something you always wanted to do? Uh, at, when you were younger or what's something that you did do when you were like even as a child an interest that you had that you maybe left behind maybe you played hockey as a kid or maybe you danced or maybe you played an instrument and come coming back to that playful part of yourself mm. even if it's for five minutes can be such a very simple self-care act yeah 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 it's it's funny yeah. you mentioned that because you know, I uh, I'm going through the reverse right now, which is you know some kids are heading off to university and some kids are heading where they've spent the majority of time at my house now spending the majority of time at mom's house. So I'm get I'm going through a mini empty nester crisis right now, if you will, where I'm I'm trying to learn what it means. I remember I think it was Monday night, uh, Monday night or Tuesday night that I didn't have any kids and I literally was just wandering around my house going, you know. I have time now. And what does that mean? And of course, that time comes with the, yay, I have time. And also at the same time, boo, I have like this 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 hole in me at the same time. But the funny thing is, is that I have I spent a lot of time really thinking about the self-care. I remember a few years ago that, you know, we, we had five kids under the roof at the time. Things were extremely stressful. Mom was finishing law school. And I could, f- like, I felt a huge weight on my shoulders. And it was December. And I did, of course, what anybody should do in December when they feel that they're in line for a stroke or a heart attack. I bought a bike and I started winter biking, <laughs> which is amazing and was amazing at the time. And I think I really do credit something like that for for getting me, getting me through. So I, I'm curious to know is I felt that way. I felt that I knew that I needed kind of that level of self-care to stay alive and to be supportive for my family. My mm-hmm. partner had a different version of understanding what self-care was at the time. Mm-hmm. How do you reconcile the two when you have two very different visions on what you should be doing on a day-to-day basis? Well, I'm going to use this example because my husband is actually a cyclist. And uh, because I, you know, you found that that was something so healing for you and it helped fill you up. And I I remember when my husband would go on these rides that would be like two or three or four hours long once a week. And when our kids were really little, I resented him for it because our visions of mm-hmm. self-care were not aligned. That's To wow. me, like exactly what you're describing, right? And it really hits home. And yeah. And so for us, we had to just keep talking it out. And I recommend that for every couple. You know, if you're feeling resentment around it, you're going to talk it out and say like, I'm like, when you go out and do that and, and you leave me in the lurch with the kids, it, it stresses me out and I feel upset with you about it. And, you know, that's when you can communicate together and figure out, okay, well then, what can work? Is it because, and you know what I'll tell you, usually it comes down to one person actually isn't taking the time for their self-care. Yeah. Okay? And it's, it's not even about the, the, the number of hours should be equal for each person because one person needs a three-hour bike ride and another person might need, you know, an hour completely alone in the house. It's go- it is going to look different. But I, by the way, I'm so to recognize. I'm so glad that the phrase spa day hasn't come up with yet. It sounds because it feels like whenever you hear self care, it's like the cliche spa day. No, not everybody no. enjoys a spa day. I Find the thing. <laughs> yeah, and it, and I think you know, Lisa. Back to what you were talking about that idea of purpose, right? Which is so prevalent right now in the corporate world. That idea of understanding why we exist and what's valuable to us. I, I'm curious to know, like, would you? Would you encourage some sort of kind of like away from the stress of the moment, uh, kind of a step back and say, let's have kind of a meta uh, conversation about what the future looks like for us before you kind of get into that? Like, have you have you seen anything quite like that? A conversation about your couple, about your relationship? Yeah, yeah. before you get into kind of like, like let's say it's month seven. Like I have, I have a friend who just had a baby like a week and a half ago. And I, I thought maybe I should have recommended to him that he has a conversation with his, his spouse beforehand. Yes, of course. Uh, like getting clear on your relationship vision is something that we, a lot of us don't do. Mm-hmm. So when I say the word relationship vision, what, what do you imagine? 
like any other vision and like a, a company, where, where is it that you want your relationship to go? How do you want it to kind of live? Yes, Lisa, exactly. And mm. after the, the, the very interesting thing is that before kids, you know, a lot of couples talk about, yes, we want kids. We're so excited to have a family. And that's where the vision ends. Right. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, now we have the baby. And there often isn't a vision, a detailed, specific vision beyond that. Right. Mm -hmm. Think about the lead up to when you have kids. You you think about you, you like create the nursery and you, you get the insurance and the wills in order and the, you know, you're doing all of these very detailed things. And then after that, where is the relationship vision? So in terms of your question, Jason, you know, your, your friends are at seven months and it's true. You do need to sit down together and, and ask, okay, what does our relationship vision look like outside of being parents? That's the key. Mm-hmm. I, w- I would think, Allison, that that's a question that needs to be asked regularly because relationship, like long term, my, my husband and I, we've been married. We'll be 15 years later this month, and but we've been together. Thank you. We've been together for 25, almost 26 years. Um, and so relationships change and, you know, you as a person change, your life changes. And so that seems like something that needs to happen. And I'm just thinking as we get older and our children get older, that our life is going to change more. Um, so do you recommend doing that regularly? Yes, absolutely. And 25 years together, I can just imagine like all of these stages of growth you've mm-hmm. been through together. Yeah. Uh, good for you i mean that's that's a long time and a lot of growing that you've done together Mm -hmm. because we are we are always changing and growing right we've been talking about our sense of self and our sense of self is always evolving even jason said you know he's feeling that empty nest he's at a different stage now and his sense of self is changing which is going to in turn change your relationship i recommend checking in on your relationship vision once a year Wow. Just, we need yeah. we need six sigma for relationships is what we need. I think it would be great. <laughs> yeah. Allison, we got to go into a break, but I know you're going to hang around for us. We're going to talk a little bit more afterwards. I know uh, we've done some social media work, and I want to talk about how to overcome things like resentment. But we'll do that in just a minute for everyone else. You know, you can reach us on social media at Parents Canada. We're on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Meanwhile, we're going to head into breaks. You are listening to Parents Canada Talk Radio on News Talk Saga 960. Welcome back to Parents Canada Talk Radio. It's Jason and Lisa here. We are talking with Allison. You know, I, I feel badly for Lisa sometimes because I, I spend the the breaks kind of like unloading my personal life and how this all works <laughs> and all that sort of stuff. But so I just wanted to let you know that I appreciate you Aww. and and the the very large ears you put on <laughs> in the room. Yeah. Uh, Allison, welcome back. We are talking obviously about how how and this is what I, the last thing that I mentioned is I, I find more and more that this show is becoming less and less about the tactical approach about how you manage your kids like the day-to-day stuff is what you know what would be great snacks for your children which are great articles and that sort of stuff but what the show is becoming is how do you actually survive and thrive as a parent which is really what we're talking about today is when you have a couple how does that couple keep that rekindling going and i know you have Mm. you have some questions yeah we got i so i put this out on on instagram uh, and got lots of uh questions that came in uh, and i'm sure allison you're just used to getting peppered with a lot of questions um but then i also had friends who saw the posts um, and were like, oh, I have questions. And then I was like, I can't get to all those. (laughs) (laughs) We'll do our best. We'll do our best. Yeah, so I'll I'll weed them down. But one uh, came from, she is expecting, I don't know how far along she is, but she's already, you know, feeling the pressure that, that, you know, she knows that parenthood is going to impact her relationship and she wants to make sure that it stays strong. And so she was asking, what are some of the things that she can do um, as, you know, and that they would be easy and be able to do while you know caring for a newborn that so that she can connect with her partner oh i love these preventative questions you know like when you're trying to think ahead and mm-hmm. and prepare yourselves right so my what i suggest for people who are about to enter parenthood is to create small habits that are just part of your life so simple daily love habits things that you do every day for each other. And that could be like Mm. maybe a little morning snuggle. That could be at night before going to bed, just saying what you're grateful for. That could be making one person uh, a cup of coffee while you're making your own. These are like the daily things that are embedded 
in our lives. It's not mm-hmm. always about like going for a big vacation or having even a date night. It's those simple things that really keep us connected. So I would say figure out what your daily love habits are and, and keep doing those because those are the small things that fill you up. The second thing I would say is is talking it out every step of the way. Talk about how you're feeling. Uh, there's going to be a lot of times where, you know, we talked earlier about self-care and that early stage as you're entering parenthood together, it's not going to be so much about your couple. It is going to be about that little baby. And just talk about that. Mm-hmm. Talk about not so much about the baby, but how you feel about it. Like, I don't even know who I am right now. I'm feeling like I really miss you. These like very simple things. Just say how you're feeling and express it to each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I, I so love love habits. Uh, I, I, I wrote that down, and I'm, I'm going to just have to use that that term in my language going forward. I call it ritual. Yeah. Like, it's, it's a, I think it's an important, uh, simple thing. Again, because my partner and I, we don't live together. One of the one of the simplest rituals we have is texting each other good morning. And I can always tell when my partner's not in a good place because it doesn't say good morning. It just says morning. And I think, okay, so that's, to me, that's a that's an invitation to say, hey, are you all right? How can I be supportive and things like that? Mm-hmm. So that, that, that's always a, a really simple way through just finding somebody disrupting the, the ritual or the habit that yeah. gets there. I, I wanted to ask the, the other end of the spectrum, which is you're, you're talking about being proactive and preventive, mm-hmm. is on the other side of the ball, what happens when the, the horses left the, the, the building and there is built up resentment? How do you walk that back and kind of get yourself back on that level playing field? Yeah, this is, you know, this is a tricky one, and we all find ourselves there sometimes. Sometimes we, we don't even realize that we've been, like, holding feelings back, and then all of a sudden they explode. Okay, right. this happens. Mm-hmm. It, it, is, it happens to the healthiest of relationships. So I just want to normalize that first off. And, you know, when that resentment does happen or it gets to that build-up breaking point, I know people, there's this, this idea that, oh, we don't want to go to bed angry. Mm-hmm. And... As much as I, I like that concept, I think it's also important that to recognize that when you are emotionally flooded, which means, you know, you're in anger or rage or, you know, uh, you know, the, the straw that, that broke the camel's back is, yeah. is happening. Mm-hmm. You're not able to access your rational brain. Oh, yeah. OK. <laughs> and so sometimes we need to say, I love you, but I'm not able to have a conversation about this right now. And I would like us to, you know, and you can even say in an hour, in two hours. You never just want to walk away and be like, I can't stand you and say something awful, right? Mm -hmm. And slam the door. You can say, I love you and I'm not able to communicate right now about this. I need some space and let's come back to this tomorrow at 10 a.m. That's you, you that second to, part, this, by the way, like, is really, it is hard, it yeah, is hard. But it's really important, and, and that's, I, I, I'm going to take that away, that idea of you almost need to kind of say, listen, this still does matter to me, and I'm not just gonna let the anger pass and then forget about it so we can have this conversation again. I love mm-hmm. that idea to say, we're gonna come back to it. it, it there was, a, what was it, on that, that television show, How I Met Your Mother? It was one of my favorite little things that, you know, there was a the couple, they loved each other very much, and they had this moment called pause which is where they were in the middle of an argument and any one of them could say, pause. And the idea was, is that the argument stopped immediately, but they had to unpause it at some point within the next, like something like two days or something like that, so that they could finish the conversation. It was really, really clever idea. Yeah. Right. They had set their own boundary yeah. and their mm-hmm. own like understanding around what pause meant. Yeah, yeah. 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 I have another question and it comes from a working mom and I, I do a lot of work with working moms and, you know, communicating with your partner and around logistics and and this is what you were talking about a lot Jason I have no idea what you're talking about yeah (laughs) it becomes that tension point and so you know there's one working mom she runs her own business she runs a bakery and she was saying that you know she does the majority of the child care they have uh, just a one year old and you know she's quite busy at work she is usually taking the child with her um, to meetings and things like that and so then she has to listen to how her partner (sighs) is so busy Um, and and she's like, you have no idea what my day has been like. Um, and then so there's that part. So there's a little bit of resentment, it sounds like. But then the mm-hmm. other part is that when she then says, I now need help, can you take a day off or can you work your schedule or however, um, you know, then it's it's almost like, 
I, I can't do that or you don't understand my perspective, I'm too busy or whatever. So how can they manage those tough conversations and keeping, you know, everyone, everyone happy? Uh, I feel I can feel so much that this couple is they're missing empathy for each other really because are. it is hard for both of them, really. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's that. That's the, the first connecting point is we all really just want to be seen and understood. So the first step is connecting and, and saying, for me, what I would say to them is that you both need to acknowledge to each other, I see what you're doing and I see how hard you're working. That is the number one. Because sometimes what happens is like, well, I'm working as hard and we we play this game of but my life is harder than yours. Mm. And that just amplifies resentment. Do you know what just totally neutralizes that is if you say, if someone says, oh, I'm having such a hard day, it's been so hard, I've had the, you know, the, the baby with me all day and I haven't had a second to sit down. Imagine if someone said, wow, that sounds like it was a really hard day. Mm. I, tell, tell me more about that. And, and then you can say, I had a hard day too, instead of, one upping each other on how hard each of your lives are. Because really, let's be honest, this is hard. I can hear this is hard for this young family. So the first step is to empathize. That would be my number one. And number two, I find this often is that one there tends to be one parent who does do the primary caregiving. They just fall into that role and or they they choose it as a family. Uh, but then they're not able to relinquish some of the control around Ooh. taking on that role. Mm-hmm. So it, 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 I'm, I'm saying that sometimes that person and the mom in this case needs to say like, I need you to be the one who gets the groceries and I'm, and I'm not going to be getting the groceries and I trust you to go and do that. So it's not that it's also, you have to let go of control if you want to get help. Right. Yeah. 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 And that can be a really difficult thing to let go of. That phrase, I trust you, is Mm -hmm. so important, particularly, you know, I'm doing a lot of reading and research on empathy for my professional life, uh, doing design thinking and things like that, and trying to understand how how you get away from that competitive model. My my life is harder, and it's that whole idea of uh, one of the pieces of reading I've done is a lot of people tend to choose a role in empathy of a victim, uh, villain, uh, or or hero, right? And mm-hmm. and it's how do you get away from that? And the way that you do that is to say, I see you. I, and I, that to, again, that really like I, I got goosebumps, and, and it actually really brought that t- together for me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's so simple, but it's so powerful. Yeah, I I hope that we have time for just one more question because there was one question that came in. A number uh, a number of folks asked various. Way, various questions about this one topic okay. and it has to do with sex and yeah. so essentially uh, it's how can we have better and more sex that um, we enjoy it as a couple so how can we have better and more, more sex? or more sex so there, there, like I said there was there was a number of people some were new parents that you know they felt the pressure to have it others uh, their libido was gone um, yeah so really what what I've kind of summarized the question down to is how can we have better or more sex that is more fulfilling and keeps the relationship stronger yes okay great question so this is a common thing libido changes Literally, women's bodies are have, have changed after giving birth, and there's and often they don't know how to navigate that. Like, what's happening to me? Like, where's my sex drive? This feels different. There's there's a lot of layers to it, and so my first the first suggestion I would say is just take the pressure off. There is no one place that your sex life needs to be. It you don't need to be having sex three times a week or even three times a month if that's not feeling right for where you are right now. Mm-hmm. So just like redefining your expectation around sex is the very, very first step. And and this is fun. Like think about, okay, like now we get to re-explore what our intimacy looks like. We've like, you've changed a lot. You know, one person's body has changed. And so now I like to take sex off the table. Now hear me out on this. Mm-hmm. It means that you're not trying to get to a destination. It means if you start making out, you're just making out and you're enjoying being in that moment. It's not you're making out to get to that end point of intercourse and climax. So this is often what the pressure is about. It's about actually 
someone has to climax. We have to get to this point. And so you can't even enjoy the making out part. So I'm not saying not have sex. I'm saying just take that expectation mm-hmm. off the table so that you can enjoy the present. Does that make sense? That does. I, I yeah, yeah. was the columnist Dan Savage actually talks about that a lot with new parents. You know, the guy he appears in the back pages of Now Magazine and is syndicated, and he does talk about that idea of if you if you give yourself permission to take that off the table, it's amazing how things can get better very quickly. Mm-hmm. Yes, exactly. And I love Esther Perel. She's a psychologist from New York City. She says, you know, we want to be having gourmet sex. Not fast food sex. <laughs> I love that. Right, yeah. <laughs> right. And you know what? That's the good way to, to finish. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Allison, we could probably spend, again, the whole the whole day. I know I could spend the whole day kind of chatting with you and that sort of mm-hmm. stuff. But then I have to find out what your rate is to be able to kind of have you know, on the couch overall. <laughs> yeah. uh, Allison Vila is a registered psychotherapist. Allison, is there anywhere we, where we can find out more about uh, your work? Yes, absolutely. So you can find me uh, at houseandandhook.com. Uh, on on our website and at House and Hook on Instagram. And in October, we have a fantastic program that's designed for busy parents. It's a membership program called Couple Sandbox, and we're going to be doing monthly content so that you can be having nourishing conversations from the comfort of home and at your own pace. So check that out. Uh, there's a waitlist sign up on the website as well as lots of free tools uh, for you to check out as a couple. Allison, thank you thank so you. much for joining us today. This was, again, another wonderfully enlightening conversation. Now you know where to find it. Actually, I'm going to check out the Sandbox, so this is fantastic. For everyone Amazing. else who's listening, if you've got if you've got more questions, if you've got more thoughts, find us, hit us up on at Parents Canada. Meanwhile, we're going to go into break. You're listening to Parents Canada Talk Radio on uh, News Talk Saga 960. Hello and welcome back. You're listening to Parents Canada Talk Radio on News Talk Saga 960. So, Jason, we've had we had Allison Vila with us. What did you learn today? I, hurt, I learned my brain hurts now because there's you know I, I, there's a whole bunch of little fragments that I want to spend kind of time unpacking. But you know the the biggest one there is empathy, and I know that 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 kind of has like a cognitive bias because that's where I'm spending a lot of my time right now. But just that ability of Getting away from the competitive model, right? You know, mm-hmm. somebody who we, you use the example of, like the husband's not really helping, but he's busy at work, and the mom's the one who's being the, the primary caregiver. The, 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 to unpack that a little bit further, what, what uh, Allison was saying was the idea that it's okay to, for him to say, you know, I'm really busy. Now, it's not I, that, that's a whole other discussion on whether it's okay to say I can't help. That's a, that I, I don't agree with that part. But what I do agree for him to say is I'm busy, I'm tired, and that sort of stuff. And that it's okay for her to say, I'm busy, I'm tired, and for Mm -hmm. them to empathize with one another to be able – because as soon as you get into the one-upmanship, as soon as you get into that kind of contest, nobody wins because you're not solving anything. All you're doing is creating triggering moments that are building that level of – I call it emotional Mm -hmm. plaque, right? Mm -hmm. That resentment that hangs around for a long time. So when we talked right at the right at the top, that's actually a really good example where, you know, mom is is, you know, just bending herself into a pretzel to be able to kind of care for this one year old and then dad's not actually contributing and is probably accelerating it. So when she comes home of the day and she says, I'm in a bad place, right? It's his role to say, tell me more about that, as opposed to, I'm in a bad place too. You know, you can get to that. You know, I always love to say to people when we're brainstorming that if you have a million dollar idea, but you're having a conversation about something else, write down the idea because it'll still be a million dollar idea in 10 minutes, Mm. is this is a really good opportunity for him to say, listen, I see you and I hear you. You're in a tough spot. Let's kind of unpack that for a little while. And then when you're done that frame of conversation for him to say, I'm also having a difficulty at work as well. Can we unpack for me as well? That. Now, that doesn't address the specific issue of, of care, but what it does is it allows them to care for each other. So I, I, that was the biggest thing that I took away. Mm-hmm. How about you? Uh, for me, it was the the vision. Um, I think that's so important. And, and like I said, I, I, I'm in a long, long-term relationship. And I, my husband and I started dating uh, when we were like 15, 16 years old. And so those are really formative years. And if I'm looking back, I can't say that we 
we purposely sat down and said, let's let's come up with our vision for our relationship. I, I, I won't say that I'm that evolved. Um, but there were a lot of times where we kind of hit forks in the road and we had to kind of sit with each other and say, OK, it looks like you're being pulled that way and I'm being pulled this way. What do we want to do here? Do we want to continue this relationship? How are we going to come together? What are the values that keep us together? And really having that conversation and where is it that we see this relationship going um i know that we've had that conversation countless times but you know what's, a, what's amazing <laughs> about that is you know the, the thing we didn't get into here but you hear uh, and read a lot about it in, in kind of parenting relationships as a power dynamic right it sounds like you guys have worked really really hard to kind of equalize that power dynamic so you are got that symbiosis where you're trying to help each other out and again mm-hmm. you know there will be moments where that doesn't happen but yeah. that is laudable and if we could all get to that idea of understanding that we've got that level of support that's mm-hmm. an incredible incredible thing yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, but I think it comes down to, and it's the thing that I'm starting to learn as I start reflecting back. So I just feel like I'm, you know, we're 15 years in. It's just, it's a bit of a milestone. And so I, there's been a lot of reflection um, that just staying as, together as a relationship, be it marriage, be it whatever your partnership status is, um, takes work. And it, it's just, so that, that's why the vision thing kind of just hit me quite hard is that that kind of brings you back together and uh, to ask each other some serious questions. Where can we learn more about some of this stuff that we've learned today? Yeah, well, there's so much on parentscanada.com. So go and take a look there. There's a few articles that really stood out for me. I don't know if you had a few. Um, one was the case for putting your marriage that before the kids that was just such a good article so kudos guys and i stepped on your line there the the, 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 the search up the case for putting your marriage before the kids mm-hmm. and that's on parents yeah and then there's there's you know there's other there's other articles as well i think there was one uh, seven ways couples can that's, connect i wrote that one down too oh that's, okay great that's so funny uh yeah so th- those are both great for you to uh to take a look at all right well that's it for this show and again and I, i'm finding that I'm getting a depth of knowledge as a parent uh, that I could not have gotten in any other way. So I'm going to I'm going to double down on what I said before is if you want to be a better parent get yourself a radio show. You've been listening to Parents Canada Talk Radio on News Talk Saga 960.